So here's another one of those weirdly... <clears throat> I, t I don't really have a term for this. It, they've introduced something in a random episode where it really has no specific bearing on anything, and it would later become a, a semi-major element. Two things, actually, in this case. The very concept of the structural integrity field, which is arguably one of the most important aspects of any spacecraft in order to deal with the whole momentum problem. And, of course, the Breen are actually mentioned for the first time in this episode. Go figure. A lot of writers worked on this one, like a lot of writers, and it kind of shows, but I do have to admit, I liked this episode a lot better this time around than I thought I would. Quick aside, for those of you not aware, uh, I have technically been disabled twice in my life, and I have had to go through some things about that <laughs> with regards to, to coping and dealing with it. I'd only point that out because obviously what I went through is not quite the same as what other people went through. All I lost was the ability to walk, you know, which is something I gained back months later after significant effort and, and cost. I got really used to scooching around on the ground, I'll tell you what. I, I bet you can't even picture that. That's okay. I don't really want you to. I, I mean, you know, I was in such a small apartment, I didn't have the ability to use the crutches to go everywhere. I used those when I went out and about. And the wheelchair, well, I only had that for like three months. But anyways, I'm getting off topic. I bring this all up because I think she actually does a pretty decent job of presenting that kind of a person. In fact, Marina Sirtis herself has said, more than once, that she actually received a lot of positive feedback personally about her portrayal as someone who has basically become disabled in this episode. And I think she deserves that. One of the things, <laughs> one of the things that is worth noting is that in season four, there was a big push to try and get some of the people who didn't have a lot of screen time more screen time. This is why we had uh, the episode Remember Me with Beverly Crusher. That's why we have this episode with Deanna Troy. And this will be a continuing effort throughout season four and season five mostly on behalf of Michael Piller, who was the big champion of this concept, but several of the actors and actresses individually were like, hey, we'd kind of like to do more stuff. And so there was a bit of pushing and, and giving and shoving as far as that goes. So it's nice to see a legitimately good Troy episode alongside seeing a legitimately good uh, Crusher episode. Now, one of the things they toyed with the idea of when they were making this episode is that her powers don't come back. Now, if you watch the episode, you can kind of see where that idea comes from, because when they talk about what's preventing her empathic abilities from working, they talk about literal brain damage, cells actually dying. So you can kind of see how, logically speaking, it would be easy to portray that as something that just doesn't get better, that the brain does not heal itself. I mean, there's a reason why nerve damage is such a serious issue in real life, why I, to this very day, cannot actually feel most of my left foot, because nerve damage generally doesn't get better. It can, under specific circumstances and specific uh, aid being put into it. But generally, that's the kind of thing that just kind of sticks with you. And I, I'm saying this, I'm actually patting my left foot because I've got my legs crossed right here in the chair to help me stand up, excuse me, sit up straighter. Anyways, I bring this up because I actually kind of like that idea, as horrible as that sounds. Partially because I think it could add for some interesting stuff in the future, especially with regards to how they could use the character. And because I am a fan of permanence, a fan of continuity, a fan of changing the status quo. The only thing that makes me hesitate on this is I'm not 100% sure what making her no longer empathic would really do for the status quo exactly. I'm not sure about that. It's an interesting thought. I'm curious, as ever, what you guys think about this concept. The episode begins with her counseling someone over the death of her husband. Uh, that woman will be Janet Brooks, who I'll be referencing three times throughout the course of this episode. And one of the things I really like about it is, unintentionally or otherwise, the episode kind of mocks the idea of the Roddenberry box. Because she's like, oh no, you know, death is a normal part of life. And it's totally cool, and yet Troy, at every if the episode in general, at every point shows that her avoiding the feelings and emotions regarding her husband's death is a bad thing and is causing her, you know, significant harm emotionally and mentally. Now, one of the things I appreciate most about this scene is it does something that unfortunately we don't get a lot of. It shows Counselor Troy being competent. 
Now, there are certain other people who should go nameless who, who have made it a regular joke about how incompetent Troy is, but the sad reality is that for the most part, we don't see a lot of competency from her. Then again, we tend to not see a lot of competency from Starfleet individuals in general, which is why I feel the need to point it out whenever someone is actually being competent. But nevertheless, she has scheduled a session with this woman on the anniversary of her husband's death and made sure when she died, when he died, excuse me, to make sure and keep at least some of his things so they wouldn't go away. Then, on this anniversary, seeing how far she's come, she confronts her directly about it, and then she pretty much hits her right in the face with it and brings out the music box and says, here, they didn't take everything. And then, of course, the woman just breaks down sobbing as, well, she needs to, to be completely blunt. Grief is one of those really horrible things that needs to be endured, not avoided, in order for proper emotional growth and recovery. It's a good scene. It's, in fact, a really good scene. And again, it shows Troy's chops. There's also a quick good line that Miss uh, Brooks says, which I actually really enjoy, and I wrote it down. I knew he was dead for the first time. I knew it when she woke up in the middle of the night. After having a really good dream. I'm sorry, this is a weird thing to comment on, but I like the fact that she woke up grief-stricken from a good dream. I've actually often said that I hate good dreams more than bad dreams. Because when you wake up from a bad dream, well, it was just a dream. But when we wake up from a good dream, it was just a dream. So, I feel you on that one, ma'am. So, they decide to go ahead and go forward with what is basically the B-plot of the episode. I, I gotta be honest, the string thing takes up a little bit too much time of the episode, if I'm honest. Even though it is integ integrally tied in to the, uh, to the A-plot, which is Troy's effect. They run into the, the two-dimensional beings, yay. The card mentions he likes horse riding again. Uh, Beverly's getting calls from all over the ship trying to deal with this. And Troy's lost her powers. Dun, dun, dun. One of the things I like about the presentation of it is it takes her a while to really acknowledge that it happened. Whereas if, for example, your eyes stopped working, you'd notice immediately, wouldn't you? I don't say that to say that's a bad thing, quite the contrary. That actually makes sense to me, that it would be a gradual repression. Since remember, this is just basically them overwhelming her senses to the point where they don't work. So, and then she, it finally kind of completely clacks out. And then she really starts to notice what's going wrong, what has been going wrong ever since it first started. So Deanna loses her temper. <laughs> a lot in this episode. Again, Sirtis does a good job of portraying this. I like how Riker is president of several avenues. In fact, it's interesting that Riker, Crusher, and Guinan all go out of their way to try and comfort and help her as she goes through the various stages of grief throughout this entire uh, sequence of events. Beverly is, of course, very honest with her. Riker is, of course, very supportive. But there's this nice little touch. There's, there's actually, they do this twice, actually. Uh, Troy is in her room, just studying, working, and the time happens that she just jumps, just, just a little bit. That's brilliant. Because, and they don't even call attention to it, but this is Troy. She's used to kind of automatically sensing when someone's at the door. So a door chime has never startled her. But for the first time in her life, she has to deal with the fact that that could just happen at a in moment's notice without warning. Now everyone else isn't startled by that because they're used to it. They're used to the fact that that chime could just happen whenever. But for her, she was going through as if there was no one there, and then, hey, it was basically like someone jumping up and startling her because she wasn't prepared for them. Like I said, nice touch. Very well done. She talks about how people treat you differently. Some people walking on eggshells. Some people, you know, reach out to her. And, and just she just completely loses her temper at Riker. I have two bits of praise for this scene. The first, if three, really. The first is the fact that once again, I kind of understand where she's coming from on that one. While I actually had some pretty supportive people taking care of me once I had my accident with my leg, I also have to admit that there are some points in my life there where people who weren't really close to me were treating me completely differently. In fact, and I don't say this to engender sympathy, just as a matter of, of fact, my girlfriend at the time actually dumped me as a consequence of me being in the wheelchair because she wasn't incapable of coping with it. She was dancing on eggshells and doing all the stuff that Troy's talking about. It just was causing problems. And 
well, then she decided she didn't want to deal with someone who couldn't be there for her as much as she needed to be there, so out she went. Probably a good thing, long-term-wise, but it's, it's interesting to think of that because I do kind of see where she's coming from on that. Second thing I like about that is he correctly identifies that she is afraid right now. Now, she is, of course, doing one of the most common human things, covering emotion with anger. Now, in this case, she's covering fear, but it's an extremely normal human response to cover any given emotion with anger. Anger is a wonderful blanket emotion, for good and for bad, and thus it's a good way to not really feel something, hide what you're feeling, or to d misdirect yourself towards something else, deliberately or otherwise. The final thing I like is that he calls her Mzadi to try and reach out to her, and she's just does like, oh, please. I know this sounds weird, but one of the things I myself have noticed in many, many uh, interactions with human beings and studying human psychology basically my entire life is that it doesn't work like in the movies, right? What I mean by that is there's that ideal of person A is reaching out to person B. Person B is distraught, upset, hurt, scared, and person A says, it's okay, I'm here for you. And they do that legitimate, genuine reaching out a hand. Not literally, metaphorically. Now, in the movies and in the shows, usually that is then re reciprocated, like, oh, thank goodness you're here. But in my experience, the first time that's done, the usual reaction is to swap the hand away. Again, metaphorically. Ah, oh, God, as if you understand. Don't give me that. Oh, what are you trying to baby me? Don't call me Imsadi. In fact, Troy's actual reaction is, with pure disdain, oh, please. That was very realistic. And I'm not actually really a big fan of realism in my fiction. But in this case, I think it worked. Because that is the accurate reaction that Troy should be having under these circumstances. Well, that's good. And I like that. So, Miss Janet Brooks comes in again. And she says, oh, I cried last night. And I'm better. It's cool. And Troy's like, I can't read you. But I want you to know that you're, you're totally wrong. One, one night of crying does not make up for months of denial. And the woman says, no, you're completely wrong, Deanna. I don't understand what you're saying. And Troy's like, ah, oh, crap, I've lost the ability to do my job. Then Troy tries to resign. <laughs> this uh, Troy starts to get hypersensitive, basically. There's a meeting which she is a part of where Jory says, I wish I could tell if they're sentient. And you could tell that that's just a casual comment. He's not looking at her. He doesn't say it in any tone that indicates that he's indicating her. And he's freaking Jordy. Of course he doesn't mean anything by it. But Troy immediately was like, what do you mean by that? Huh? Nothing. I don't mean anything by it. What are you talking about? <laughs> Notice that after she blows up at him for a second there, Riker diverts all his attention back to her. Once again, concerned. As I've said before, whether or not there's a romantic connection there, there has always been a wonderful connection, regardless of exact type between Troy and Riker. This episode is another good example of that. And so you could tell the concern is just right on display there. Then she bar barges out. She's like, ah, yeah. And so, you know, I, I can't do my job. And there's this wonderful point where she just blows up at Crusher. How do you people live like this? How do you do this? And she actually storms out of the office after yelling at Beverly for having failed her as a friend, which obviously she didn't do, but you get the point. And... Although some people have argued that over the years. I don't think it would have made a difference personally, but whatever. And so she goes out. And once again, I want to give credit to Marina Sirtis because the next two scenes have no dialogue. And yet she conveys a great amount of emotion, multiple different emotions, over the course of those scenes. And her body language is all about it. It is so rigid and uncertain and then completely withdrawn. It's good stuff. Very well acted. So then she tries to resign, and I like how Picard has no idea how to deal with this. So he basically leans on the two things he knows best how to do. First thing he does is he tries to basically say uh, no. And then when she pulls out, she, she insists, he's like, all right, well, let me pull out a Picard speech, because I'm damn good at those. And she actually shuts him down before he can finish. So he's just like, okay. So she leaves. Then Troy is in her room. And Riker comes in, and she's like, I really would rather be alone right now. And he says, too bad. And what I love is he just stands there for a moment. And she, once again, great body language. She just kind of slowly wilts a little bit and then just kind of falls into him. 
<laughs> like not literally. It's 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 more a gradual thing like that. But she effectively just falls into him and he just holds her as close as he could, like it's okay, it's okay. And <laughs> there's actually this really great line. Do you uh do you always use this to deal with personnel problems? And he's like, sure. You'd be surprised what a good hug does for Jordy. A wharf. And she of course laughs. And then she starts finally opening up about what she's dealing with because she's resigning due to her own lack of ability to cope. That she is 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 flailing wildly and failing miserably at actually dealing with this, at coping with this, like she has been trying to counsel others to do. And two things are mentioned. First of all, Riker kind of pushes her pretty hard, actually, by insisting that she likes to be in control of situations and, you know, the whole aristocratic thing. Now, you can tell based on inference that he doesn't mean that with total sincerity, that he is prodding her to try and get her to open up a little bit and to deal with this. This is something that Guinan does in the very next scene. So that's interesting. The thing I really find interesting is she says how hollow people are, how I can't even see you. You're, you're no more real to me than a holodeck character. You're not really there. Now, what I find most interesting about that is that that makes perfect sense. Now, Troy obviously does have some psychological ability and training. This is demonstrated in this very episode. And yet it becomes clear, by the way she's talking about this, that Troy has learned to lean on the crutch of her empathic abilities, right? I myself am someone who has studied human behavior and psychology all my life. And I mention that once again to reiterate the point that I have learned to notice all the little details. It's actually really great when it comes to analyzing fiction, especially when you have a really good actor and a really good director on board, because you can see all those little details that they're putting out in their performance. But this applies to real life just as well. My sister and I actually have a little bit of a common joke in that we know each other better than anyone else because we pay attention to all those little details. That this exact and specific tone of, hmm, can imply everything it needs to and be fully communicative. There's actually no joke. Sometimes she and I have communicated entire conversations to each other without saying a word, just being like, hmm? Mm. 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 And we can do that because we're paying attention. That's the point. Because if you understand how human beings work, you can pick up on all those little details to have the perception needed to basically know as much as you can about the person in question, right? To be able to understand everything that they are not saying, why they're not saying it, why they're saying what they're saying, and all the other, like the 90% of communication that isn't the words coming out of the mouth. I get the very strong impression that Troy barely knows any of that, that she probably has at least some understanding of that, but she has leaned so hard on that empathic thing that she's gotten used to it to the point where she hasn't, for lack of a better way to put it, practiced her basic perception of other people's interactions. And I love that, and that's one of the reasons why I kind of wish she had stayed without her powers, to help develop her more as a character. Someone has to basically relearn how to read people, right? Anyways, I just thought that was a great character moment. I really wanted to, to gush about that one. So Guinan is great, as usual. Guinan actually said she made, uh, or excuse me, other people said Guinan actually made time to make sure she appeared on this episode, just because just Guinan, or excuse me, Whoopi Goldberg is awesome. Um, and of course she says she's gunning for Troy's job and blah, blah, blah. But the whole point of the conversation is fascinating because she's trying to get Troy to realize that she has more to lean on than her empathy, that she does have some skill other than just vroom, vroom, vroom. And that's good. That's good, and it's the exact right way to prod her, to show that there is another side of her, and to show that she can lean on other skills and talents that she has. Then, well, the episode kind of winds down pretty quickly. The the string plot, like I said, is just kind of like, eh. It has, there's one good scene. One good scene about the string plot, in my opinion. And it's the scene where they decide to go ahead and toss some torpedoes at them in order to dis discourage them from going into the string, because they're dragging the Enterprise with it. And, of course, you know, everyone's like, no, we can't just destroy these people. Is it them or us? And, and they're like, well, why don't we go ahead and try putting it in front of the path, see what happens there. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and do that. Show us the graphic. We'll show up. And then nothing happens. The music gets really quiet. It's still there. And the camera then focuses in on Picard as he, with grim determination, says, go ahead and target the field. That's a good scene because it shows all of the gravity of what Picard's choice is, that he is as a last resort, choosing the life of his crew over the life of these strangers. Now, it doesn't work, but it's still a very good moment, and I just wanted to give praise where praise is due. 
So then Janet Brooks shows up again. He's like, it's okay, you were right about me, you were right about me. And Troy starts to realize that she does have some skill other than her empathic abilities. But I did, I did mention I wanted to say one other thing about this. See, Janet Brooks, that's the character name, not the actress name. The actress's name is Kim Braden. Uh, Janet Brooks, she had just lost her husband on the Enterprise, and she's grief-stricken. But it's okay, because someday she'll marry Picard. And maybe Picard actually killed her husband. Maybe that's what's really going on here. Hmm. On the off chance that you don't get the joke, Kim Braden played Picard's fictional wife in the Nexus in Generations. And it's hard to miss that because she has a very distinctive face and a very distinctive appearance. And so it's just kind of like, whoa, I guess he thought more fondly of her than I thought. Didn't she lose a husband? Hmm. Anyways. And considering that's the fantasy thing, I mean, you get where the joke comes from. Anyways. So, you know... Picard brings her in and is like, look. And he doesn't try a speech. He doesn't try anything. He just says, we're going to die in an hour. You understand psychology. Go meet with Data and help us. We need you. Bam! Just right up front. Completely bluntly, uh, you know, overwhelmingly honest to her. So she goes. She starts to think maybe they're going after the string on purpose. And with that hypothesis, decide, they decide to technobabble their way out of the situation. They do, and they win. And then, ah, oh, her abilities are back. I still regret that. But what can you do? I have to say, though, it is night and day. I want you to do, a, do me a favor. You don't have to, of course. But just to really emphasize this, I did this myself. I went ahead and back and pulled up uh, Encounter at Farpoint, the end of Encounter at Farpoint, when the, the tentacle things, whose names I don't even remember right now, um, you know, embrace in space, right? And Troy's like, oh, great happiness and joy. You remember that scene? Watch that, then watch the end of this episode. It is night and day, the quality of the performance. Again, no no shade slung at Marina Sirtis. I'm just saying, it's not like the woman can't act. We see evidence of this in this episode, anyways. And then, of course, the episode ends with her, Crusher, and Guinan, the three people who were... Uh, her, Crusher, Riker, and Guinan, the three people who are trying to help her throughout the episode. She apologizes to Crusher, feels bad about it. She thanks Guinan, she feels bad about that. And then she and Riker have a tender moment, but it has to end on that. If you ever call me aristocratic again, and then there's just this sort of a grin. You know, the end. Overall, a surprisingly good episode. I, I really forgot how much good there was in this episode. I even have very few complaints. A final personal note. I know you guys don't actually care, but I like to keep all of these notebooks that I do these notes on. And this is the last page of this particular notebook, so... Uh, we will actually be opening up a new notebook, which always feels kind of weird uh, when I do that. It looks like my first pages here were about Deep Space Nine episodes. Yes, this is the luck episode of Deep Space Nine. I don't remember the name of it, but I remember that one. And this is a Data's Beard, which, if I'm not mistaken, that was a Season 1 episode. So we've actually managed to get through a significant amount of Deep Space Nine, several main ruminations, Friday ruminations, and Season 1, 2, and 3, and into 4... All in this one notebook. That's why I like to keep these. I'm, I'm a sentimental sap, and I like to look back at history every now and again. I hope you guys have enjoyed. I'll see you next time.